West Nile virus a biological weapon? Do your research on the United States Army Biological Weapons Lab in Fort Detrick, Maryland. This is where most of these diseases were engineered and manufactured. Not outright created, but manipulated from naturally occurring diseases. Is it a coincidence that the U.S. Army Biological Weapons Lab shut down last year, 2019, out of nowhere? Is that a coincidence that they closed operations in 2019 and we get a COVID pandemic in 2020? Is that a coincidence? Of course not. There are no coincidences when it comes to politics. They shut down operations to hide their involvement in this pandemic. And let me give you three reasons why this happened and why it happened now. Reason number one, according to Rockefeller World Population Council projections in United Nations projections, the elderly will surpass the youth as the most populated age group in the world in the next 30 years. Africa has the oldest living people in the world. Africa will also give birth to the oldest population in the world over the next 30 years. That is a problem for capitalism. And the reason it is a problem for capitalism is because you are only good to capitalism if you can work or if you can purchase. If you cannot work and you cannot purchase, you are no good to capitalism. Capitalism needs people who can produce and capitalism needs people who can consume. Elders are no longer able to able to produce, not to the level that capitalism wants them to. And elders are not necessarily interested in consuming because they are at an age where they don't necessarily need much and are not able to purchase much. So from a narrow minded, selfish capitalist perspective, Old people are bad for business. If you wonder why Italy has been hit so hard, although it is a white country, the reason Italy was hit so hard is because Italy ha has one of the oldest populations in the world. Italy has one of the oldest populations in the world. And it is a population that was given a flu vaccination just a couple years ago. Part of this COVID is also to cover up the side effects of vaccinations that Bill Gates, the Rockefeller World Population Council, the United Nations has been pushing out around the world. My biggest concern for Africa post COVID is the medical state of Africa, the medical state of Africa. A couple of days ago, the president of Ghana is the medical state of Africa, the medical state of Africa. A couple of days ago, the president of Ghana signed off. A couple of days ago, the president of Ghana signed off on Bill Gates's vaccination protocol. Why would the president of such a progressive pan-Africanist nation such as Ghana sign off on the vaccination protocol? He is now beholden to the Western powers to make sure that almost every citizen in Ghana is given Bill Gates chemicals of death. And let us be clear, these vaccinations that they're pushing in Africa are not helping anybody live longer. African people don't need Western vaccinations in order to live longer. You all know this, you're in Africa. It is not uncommon to walk into a village and find a group of women or men who are beyond the age of 100, still living, breathing, talking and walking. We don't need vaccinations. We need better diet and we need a better quality of life. Just as dangerous as vaccinations is stress. The stress from not knowing if your children are going to be properly educated. The stress of not knowing if you'll be able to pay bills. The stress of not knowing if you can take care of your family. Stress kills you just as quickly as poor health care can. Moving on and then I want to conclude because I don't want to go past my time. We have to recognize that African people globally have been psychologically defeated. If we do not accept this psychological reality, it will be difficult to solve our problems. Speaking as a psychologist, you have to admit you have a problem before you can solve it. 
And African people globally, we are in denial about our psychological state. Despite how much we say we love Africa, despite how much we claim to be Pan-Africanists, despite how much we claim to love our black skin and our nappy hair, look at our behavior. Our behavior is not consistent with the people that loves themselves. You cannot tell me you love being an African woman, but your hair is not natural or your hair is in a European hair color. You can't tell me you love being an African man, but your wife does not look like your mother or your wife is from another race. How do you explain that contradiction? How do you justify that contradiction? We're not fooling nobody but ourselves. We have been psychologically defeated. The average African in the world does not believe we can overcome oppression. Although patience is a virtue, although patience is a virtue, it is not a virtue when it comes to oppression. Patience is not a virtue when it comes to, to oppression. What do I mean by this? Psychologically speaking, the longer a people are under oppression, the greater their belief will become in that oppression. The longer a people are under oppression, the greater will be their confidence in that oppression. We cannot be patient with oppression because in doing so, every subsequent generation of African children around the world will believe even more so than their parents that we cannot come out from under the oppression. African Liberation Day. African Liberation Day is today, but we have to liberate the African mind or you will liberate nothing else. There can be no economic revolution in Africa. There can be no political revolution in Africa. There can be no spiritual revolution in Africa. There can be no intellectual revolution in Africa or throughout the diaspora until there is first a psychological revolution. You must change the consciousness of the African. If you do not change his consciousness, you change nothing else. And what are the first two steps to transforming consciousness? And I'll end on this point. Education and economics. Whoever controls the education and controls the economics controls the destiny of that people. I don't care what color they are. I don't care in what era they live. I don't care what flag they pledge allegiance to. I don't care what race, ethnicity or nationality. Who controls the education of the children and who controls the economics controls the destiny of that people. Clearly, the economics of African people are in the hands of non-Africans. That's not only true in Africa. It is true everywhere in the world. I've spoken on every continent except Australia. Every continent except Australia and throughout the Caribbean, I have never seen yet in my life an economy that is controlled by black folks, even when we are in the numerical majority. How do you explain that? I don't care if you're in Jamaica. I don't care if you're in Suriname, Toronto, London, New York City. I don't care if you're in Accra. I don't care if you're in Ethiopia. Go anywhere in the African world. Even when we are in the majority, our economy is in the hands of other people. Most African currency is backed by a European bank. Most African currency is created in a European bank. How in the hell can there ever be economic liberation when the same people who colonized you, the same people who colonized us, are printing our money and insuring our money. I read an article when I was in Paris last. I read an article when I was in Paris last where the president of France had told the Francophone African colonies that they were only going to print a certain amount of money. We're only going to make a certain amount of currency for your country to use. How do you let another country who you claim you have independence from, dictate how much of your own money you can have. Let me say this piece. Economics is more about psychology 
It looks like I went out there. Am I still there? I'm not sure what happened. Am I still there, family? I can hear you. Okay, you can hear me, so I will continue. Economics is as much about psychology as it is about taking care of one's family. Economics is psychological. When an African child in the Congo or an African child in Lesotho or an African child in Gabon or an African child in Eritrea or an African child in Philadelphia or South Carolina or London or Birmingham or Luton or Wolverhampton or Jamaica or Cuba or Haiti, wherever we are, if an African child has to go outside of his community to find a job, if an African child has to go and beg another race for a job, I can guarantee you that that is not an African child who's going to put much respect on loyalty to his community. If we want African people to be loyal, we must give them something to be loyal for. It is not enough to teach our great African history. It is not enough to beat the drum and wear the dashiki. It is not enough to teach African languages. It is not enough to teach about the great kings and queens of Nile culture. It's not enough. You cannot win a war that you're fighting today by constantly running back to the past to escape your present. I want to say that again. If we believe we're going to keep the loyalty of our children by escaping the present to run back 5,000 years ago to teach them how great we are, we're going to lose. In fact, the European and the Chinese will give you the pass if that's all you want. If the only thing black people want in this world is to be recognized for being the originators of civilization, they will give you that. Because the white man says, I own the present. If the black man wants the past, go ahead and take it. I own the present. And the Chinese man is saying, I own the future. So if the white man owns the present and the black man owns the past and the Chinese owns the future, where does that leave us? Speaking of China. Speaking of China. It is absolutely disrespectful to all of those who fought those bloody wars for independence for African leaders to be turning towards China and now selling out the best interests of African nations to the Chinese. Do you really think the Chinese will be a better colonizer than the European? Do you really think the Chinese will be more benevolent to black people than the Europeans were? Of course they won't. It's no coincidence that the Chinese are bringing their militaries with them when they come to Africa. Why is a sovereign, so-called independent African nation allowing Chinese businesses to bring their own militaries with them? You don't bring a military into my country, but the Chinese are bringing their militaries with them into Africa. What's going to happen? What is going to happen in Africa when the Chinese conduct their first coup? What's going to happen in Africa? When the Chinese overthrow the first president of Africa because it's coming. Oh, it's coming. It's a part of colonialism. A part of colonialism is selecting the leadership who is most conducive to your foreign agenda. It is a matter of time before the Chinese conduct their first overthrow of an African president. What are we going to do then? What are we going to do then? What are we going to do then? My enemy's enemy is not my friend. My enemy's enemy has never been my friend. We have to wake up. We have to politically educate our African youth, brothers and sisters. We have to stop taking loans from the World Bank. Stop taking loans from the IMF. And let me say this. Let me say this. Until African language, indigenous African language becomes the primary medium of instruction in every African nation, African people will never be free. Let me say it again. In almost every African nation on the continent and in the Caribbean and in Central and South America, the colonizer's language is still the medium of instruction. You go to an Anglophone country, 
English is still the medium of instruction. You go to a Francophone country, France is still the medium of instruction. Why are we claiming to be free when our children are still being taught through the language of the colonizer? We need a United States of Africa that is more than a flag, more than a symbol, more than a meeting, more than a building. We need a meaningful and progressive United States of Africa that has the ability to veto the decisions that are made by independent African parliaments that are not in the best interest of our people. I close with a quote from the most honorable Marcus Garvey. I close with a quote from the most honorable Marcus Garvey who said, Without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life. Without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life. But with confidence, you have won even before you have started. And one last point, just one last point. The greatest contradiction of pan-African nationalism globally, the greatest contradiction a revolutionary pan-African nationalism globally is that most of us are still more loyal to our tribes than we are to the African family. That's right. In black America, we're more loyal to our religions and our fraternal organizations and our petty uh political organizations than we are to the African family. In Africa, being the part of a tribe is more loyal, more important to many of our people than being a part of the African family until the Zulu and the Kosa eliminate petty differences, nothing changes. Until the Wolof on the Mandinko eliminate petty differences, nothing changes. And I'm only using them as an example, not to say that they necessarily have conflict. But when I travel through the continent, I see the tribalism. I feel the tribalism. And one of the greatest weapons used by African leaders is to do what? Instigate tribalism at election time to stay in office. In Africa, people are not voting for the best person. They're voting for the person who belongs to their tribe, whether or not that person has an agenda for the people. Those are my words. Black power. Your voice is very low, my brother. Your voice is very low. Okay. You're clear, but you're low. Your voice is uh, relatively clear, but it's so low, I can hardly hear it. I don't know if you can turn the volume up. I am very, very sorry for that. I would like to speak as loud as possible. Okay. And I would say I am very, very sorry. Uh, I was supposed to read your biography before you started. No worries. No worries on the bio. That's not important. Biography is not important. <laughs> You don't have to read. You don't have to read mine too. So, because we all, it's almost over an hour. So, don't worry about the biography. Okay, you can you can start. Well, I must say, uh, first, I'm really inspired listening to the two gentlemen. And uh, uh, first, Nyang Jai, an economist, and Omar. I've actually been following some of these. Uh, there's one that he. I think he was doing an interview where he was speaking about the relationship between Africa and the Chinese that he mentioned that briefly. Um, uh, that was the first time that I, I listened to him. And I must admit, uh, one of uh, his statements really touched me when he said, um, if we really want to uh, liberate ourselves, for instance, an African woman should use our own hair. And I feel guilty about that. And I feel like putting my hair in a bun, I'm, I understand, but what happened actually is how uh, the week that we started messed up one of our hair, and you're right, if we started with our own natural hair, we would not be able to, uh, we would not have to do all of it. Uh, but yes, I'm going to speak about COVID-19, and then uh, later on, uh, when we open for uh, questions.